Thank you all for coming out. If you are needing to make sense of the global economy, tonight is your night. <laughs> Beginning with uh, Linda Yu, a renowned economist, writer, and broadcaster. She has this wonderful arc of uh, going from an authoritative academic into journalism, uh, back to academia, and never losing touch of uh, the great masses who need some help understanding the economy. She holds senior positions at leading universities, among them Oxford, the London Business School, and the London School of Economics. She's hosted her own programs at the BBC and at Bloomberg. And her latest book, I, I heartily recommend recommend to you all. It's called The Great Economists, How Their Ideas Can Help Us Today. It was selected by The Times and Newsweek magazine as a best book of 2018. It's, it's a really excellent distillation of the whole sweep of modern uh, economic history uh, with contemporary lessons from the great masters of economics. And with that, I give you Linda Yu. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, you'll get your payment afterwards. <laughs> um, but thank you very much to London Speaker Bureau. And thank you very much to Wendy, who I've worked with a number of years. It's just um, to Tom, to the entire team. I'm not going to start naming people. This is going to take a long time. Um, but just to say, it's a wonderful bureau. And it's, a real, it's been a real pleasure um, to work with them and to uh, thank them for inviting me here this evening to say a few words. And we'll try to make sense of the global economy. Um, and I think. Probably, this is actually one of the most important times to do so. So, um, Peter mentioned my book. Um, I have essentially decided to follow um, the advice of Mark Twain. <laughs> so, Mark Twain reportedly said, um, history doesn't rhyme, uh, sorry, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And it seemed to me that if you wanted to understand the big, questions of today, why not look at um, what the lessons of history could tell us? Because quite a lot of the issues that we uh, face today um, have had echoes in history, not identical, but very similar um, challenges. And we've come through them. So looking at 250 years of economic history, um, I think we're in an age of prosperity um, because of ideas um, that have changed the world, battle of ideas when the current system doesn't work. And um, we've come through it um, stronger. But at the moment, we are in a period where there is a lack of consensus around the big topics of the day. And this is why I think it's even more important to think about the way that um, the wisdom um, of the great economists can help us um, navigate through some of these big issues as we try to come to a consensus um, in the coming, hopefully, years and not decades. So I'm going to focus on a couple of issues from my book and the ideas of the great economists behind them to give you a sense of what I think some of the big um, issues, at least issues, are um, that need resolving. So the first one is why are wages so low? This is one of the most striking things, I think, about um, our world today. Um, median wages, so that's the wage of the person in the middle of the income distribution. Now, that hasn't increased in this country for a decade. In Germany and Japan, it's been 20 years. And in the United States, wages for the median person haven't risen since the 1970s. So there is a real sense of how is it possible that we seem to live in an age of prosperity, but there's a hollowing out of the middle class. Why are wages so low? So in that um, chapter, I look at this question and I draw on the idea of the great economist, Joan Robinson, the Cambridge economist, who came up with the concept of monopsony, which is when firms have market power, but in the labor market. So it's not like monopolies, which um, we're familiar with um, in the product market, but this is in the labor market. So to understand her ideas, I think it's important to understand her life. So I also, each chapter has a bit of a biography. So Joan Robinson was a Cambridge economist. She made her name in the 1930s. She became one of the best known disciples of John Maynard Keynes. So there were five people entrusted um, with reviewing Keynes's general theory. So Robinson was one of them. She was married to another member of the inner circle and she was having an affair with yet another member. So I like to think she had the casting vote on the general theory. <laughs> Um, so Robinson's um, ideas in the 1930s came about because she was working 
at the time when unemployment was a huge problem, disguised unemployment, low wages, similar issues to what we face today, again, after a systemic banking crisis um, and a period, a slow period of recovery, and of course, this concern about stagnation. And her ideas around um, monopsony um, are centered um, on understanding um, things that are still relevant today, like um, disguised unemployment. So you have people who want um, a full-time job, but can only get a part-time job. So that's one of the reasons why wages are so low. So I still remember I was um, uh, listening to President Bill Clinton, and um, he was talking about the number of jobs that were created. Um, and a woman raised her hand in the audience and said, Mr. President, I have three of those jobs, and I still can't make ends meet. And so this is a long-standing issue. We need to look hard at why it is that um, people's wages are not um, improving. What standards, why um, do we have part-time work, disguised unemployment? What are the things that we can be looking at to try and address monopsony, which is currently um, the topic that's being discussed at Jackson Hole, which is the annual gathering of central bankers and policymakers. They're looking at uh, Robinson's theories to try and gain some insights around that. And the 1930s really does hold um, huge lessons for another big challenge that I focus on, which I think is one of the biggest challenge that we face, which is, do we face a slow growth future? So, Secular stagnation, this concept um, that Larry Summers has revived, is around this idea that because uh, productivity growth is slow, if you look at growth rates in advanced economies, it's slowed down substantially um, since the crash. So secular stagnation um, is centered on a couple of things. So one of the things is, can the technologies of today raise productivity across um, the economy? So, can uh, smartphones be as good as electrification? Um, well, one Bank of England study shows that as smartphone penetration goes this way, um, productivity goes this way. <laughs> Um, so, so this question um, around how to raise productivity, can we have these breakthroughs, that's one of the big challenges why we might face a slow growth future. So that really gives you a sense of that's why we need to focus on it. The other aspect of a slow growth future is an aging society. So aging societies have lower productivity. Japan is the leading example. But the older I get, the less I accept that getting older means you can become less productive. Um, but but um, so, so coming back to lessons from history, secular stagnation wasn't invented by Larry Summers. It was a term coined by Alvin Hansen in 1939. So after the Great Crash, the Great Depression, there was a second recession in 1930s that hit in 1937, 1938. At that point, he was writing about aging society, slow productivity growth, and saying, my goodness, we face a slow growth future. Um, and yet, in the 1950s and 60s, we experienced the golden age of economic growth, the strongest growth of average incomes and standards of living um, that we've seen in modern times. And yet, um, well, okay, there was, a, there was a world war in between there. <laughs> you know, and yet, I think um, when we revive this concept, I think there are lessons, as I say, to look at, but not to become too, I think, pessimistic about our prospects, but to recognize um, that this was overcome in the past and the kinds of lessons that we might draw from it. Now, I know economics is not everybody's cup of tea, um, so I'm just going to finish uh, with a quote um, by Joan Robinson as to why everyone should know some economics. So Robinson said, um, the purpose of studying economics is not to gain ready-made answers to economic questions, but to learn how to avoid being deceived by economists. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, we're only getting started. Uh, if you're among the people who think that everything is just fine as it is in the global economy and we can carry on and uh, look forward to future prosperity and happiness, uh, Paul Mason is here to shake up your worldview. Uh, Paul's a writer. 
He's an award-winning Channel 4 presenter, a filmmaker, and a journalist. He was the economics editor of Channel 4 News, and prior to that, he was Channel 4's culture and digital editor, uh, where he explored social, cultural, and business impact of uh, the new age of digital and online. He's tapped a lot of that thinking in producing a really terrific and, and very engaging book uh, that I also would recommend to you uh, after you're done with Linda's book, Post-Capitalism, A Guide to Our Future, uh, and his latest release, uh, Clear, Bright Future, which is really a call to arms, uh, a very provocative book. And uh, with that, here is Paul. Well, it's good to be here, and thanks again for, to LSB for inviting me. Um, so, a couple of years ago, I was filming a riot. It's something that, that, that we tend to do, uh, my kind of journalists. And um, the riot's in full swing, windows are being smashed, SUVs are on fire, and a, t and a hand comes on my shoulder, and it's an old friend, Ross. Uh, Ross Damoni, and, uh, and he, he's another riot filmer, but he really is really hardcore. Uh, he's been to them all, Brazil, Greece, Ukraine. Hi, Ross, and off he goes into this kind of craziness. And then another guy runs past me, um, Brandon Jourdan, different kind of filmmaker, more thoughtful. Around, I haven't seen you since Amsterdam. Yeah, what were we doing? Our oh, riot. Yeah, Greece, yeah, Turkey, the Gezi Park uprising. We hid under a bush so the police couldn't find us. This is Washington, D.C., and three experts, or two experts, and a, and a wannabe, me, at filming countries going to shit, are filming the capital of the world. That's the situation we're in. And it's no wonder that at many business conferences, many of us experience this. Do you experience it? Um, technological euphoria and geopolitical doom. So the, 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 the PowerPoint slides are all about the five to 10 year tech uh, pipeline of, of individual companies and sectors, what they're going to invent, how they're going to transform human life, how much better automobiles are going to get. And then in the bar, everybody talks about how do you buy an island? You know, how do you buy an island so you can survive what's coming? Uh, or are you in gold or Bitcoin? That's the other uh, great bar stool conversation of executives. Um, and both these, the technological uh, euphoria is, I think, justified. Um, it took us 300,000 years to get from stone tools to steam engines, 200 from steam engines to uh, silicon chips, four atoms thick, uh, with a trillion switches on them. More switches than human beings have ever created on one chip. There's more switches in this room, I think. Three billion per mobile phone uh, than, than, than created in the history of electrical engineering. So technological euphoria is justified, but so is the geopolitical doom. And in the book, in, in uh, Clear Bright Future, I try and talk about three related crises that we're living through. There's the economic crisis. There's a system in the West, anyway, that is not working for many people. Many people just don't know how the wage suppression issue is one part of it. They just don't know how their lives are going to be better uh, in the future and how their children's lives are going to be better. And as I've reported that, it spilled over into a social crisis, and now into, in, in some Western societies, a fairly severe crisis of belief in democracy, the rule of law, and universal human rights. Uh, by members of the authoritarian right, human rights are, are seen as for other people. They're an imposition on me. They're not my rights. They're the rights of people I don't like. Now, I think this is rooted as, uh, you know, if you see... <laughs> If you see a surgeon, you're going to get operated on. If you see a, a psychiatrist, you're going to get uh, analysed. If you speak to an economist, an economist will tell you this has economic roots. Uh, and I think that what we're living through does have a, a root, rootedness in the problem that Linda talked about. And I think most people in, in this general area are concerned with of strategic low growth especially of developed world societies. Now, without getting into the technicalities of the secular stagnation thesis, I, I tend to draw on a, a, a view that says the sources of growth that we've had over the last 30 years are not very sustainable, especially in the developed world. So if you think about global growth, you could say three main contributors for it, to it over the last 30 years, 40 years. Um, more people. So more people with higher human capital. Someone comes out of the rice field in the Philippines to a slum. Yes, horrible, but they're now a taxi driver. And they now have consumer spending. They're not living hand to mouth. That's the, the source of the great upswing in human development. More people. Um, and catch-up growth. So 
Turkey becomes more like Yugoslavia. Somewhere like Syria becomes more like Turkey. Somewhere like Cameroon becomes more like Syria. So catch-up growth is, when you know what the model is, you need some fast trains, you need Wi-Fi, you need uh, an education system for, 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 for primary educated uh, children. That's been happening, and that's been relentless and good. But productivity growth has been not so good. In fact, according to the Bank of England, it's not been very good at all. It's been negative uh, over, over the period. And I think that will uh, be a problem unless we can solve it, because the other two can't be relied on to keep growth going. And that is, a way, in a way, what I think people like Donald Trump have sensed, or the elites supporting Trump. That is, and, and, those, and others like him. If there's only going to be so much growth in the world, better start competing for it. Rather than everybody dips into the cookie jar on an equal basis of a relatively decent supply of wealth, there's not, it's going to be your loss is my gain, a zero or negative sum gain. That's, what's, that's what, has, to me, has changed uh, the political situation. Now, alongside this, and often discussed in complete isolation from it, is the, problem, the technological dysfunction of modern society. So I think, you know, we're, we live in an age of great possibility technologically, but what have we got? We've got huge monopolies. Uh, in addition to monopsonies, we've got monopolies, uh, more powerful than ever before. They are now under, of course, threat of, of, of breakup. Seven out of the ten biggest m companies by market cap in the world are tech monopolies whose, whose business model will be, will be gone without their monopoly position, uh, to being the Chinese companies as well, Tencent and Alibaba. Um, we've got... Precarity, the precarity of employment. So in, you know, a great figure is, in, we're meant to be fearing automation, yes, and automation will come. But instead of automation, in this country, there used to be 4,000 installed car wash machines in, in four courts of uh, petrol garages. Um, there's no 1,000. What have been replaced by? 20,000 hand car washes. Uh, unfortunately, staffed by some very, very uh, exploited and, and oppressed people. Um, we're not automating. We're doing the opposite. We're, 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 intru we're, we're introducing more and more precarious work. We are rewarding the rent seekers. You live, in a, we're, you live in a city that rewards rent seekers, people who speculatively build apartments that no one lives in, or um, in some cases, uh, play fast and loose with the regulation to create certain companies that uh, regulators then have to catch up with. And we've got this vast asymmetry of power between people and corporations when it comes to data. I think these can be overcome by conceiving in our minds a new model. And I, the book you'd refer to is called Post-Capitalism, but I'm absolutely clear that to, 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 to solve the problems of the next 10 years, we need just a different form of capitalism. And much of my work is devoted to exploring what that might be, talking to the people who might want to do it, uh, and, and, and looking at why people resist it. And to finish, I'll just give you four heads of what, what that might come out of. I think the zero carbon imperative, now the IPCC report, October 2018, tells us we must halve carbon out, uh, as consumption in the next 10 years, 11 years. This is now giving people permission to, to imagine, rather in the way the Second World War did. And the American left, uh, uh, Sanders, Ocasio-Cortez, overtly link their vision of the, of the Green New Deal transformation to the, Frederick, to the Frank, Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, expansion of the early World War II. What does that give them permission to do is to imagine assembling large piles of debts that never get paid back. And who's their role model? Donald Trump, because that's exactly what he's doing. Um, so this, the new fiscal expansionary capitalism, I think, is coming to the West. It may not come to Europe for quite some time because Europe is structured not to do it, but it's coming to, the, to, to America, and I think it will come here. What, what, whatever replaces this absolute fiasco that we're living through here will be an expansionary capitalism, a one that borrows to spend to rebuild, whether it's left or right. I think it will be, we are looking at a highly automated society. Um, and high cultural uh, consumption in the future. The two to go together. The six-day weeks being pioneered in Sweden, the basic income being pioneered in, in Finland, despite the problems, lead to a situation where you need high cultural consumption. I think that is what emerges. But to make it happen, we're going to have to 
delink work from wages. So we have to find ways of making people's incomes not reliant on hours of work done. And to do all of that, we're going to need some kind of debate in society about what politics is there to do. And I'm part of that debate. People will know that I, I'm aligned in general with the left, both here in the United States, in Greece and in Spain. I do some, a lot of speaking work and talking. But, but I think the really interesting thing is to know here, as we hear, I think we may hear tonight, businesses asking, how do we take part? And civil society groups, how, to, how do we take part in doing the thought work for the new kind of system that we're going to need? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this is the part of the program where we all sit here uh, and bat some of these issues around in greater detail. Uh, Linda, have a seat. Thank you. Uh, I think that a casual listener to this conversation and many conversations about the global economy uh, would be forgiven for confusion on one basic point. On, on the one hand, both of you have written and spoken quite eloquently uh, about the potential threat of automation. Uh, so we, we all know, if we're paying attention, that between AI and robotics and tweaks to existing uh, production processes, there are all sorts of ways in which we can substitute machines for human labor and that holds the potential to put a lot of people out of work. There's a debate about whether new jobs get created, but nonetheless, that's a threat. On the other hand, both of you have spoken about the uh, lack of productivity and uh, productivity uh, weakness being a real concern, uh, certainly here in the UK, but also uh, in, in the US and in other uh, advanced economies. What's up with that? Uh, how can it be that the robots are supposedly coming for our jobs and yet in the traditional data uh, we don't see the productivity gains that we would see if the robots were doing such a great job replacing all of us uh, humans? Uh, Linda, why don't we start with you? Um, yeah, it's a great question and I think um Thinking about, um, again, lessons from history, um, this was observed um, in the 1980s, um, the fact that the computer age is everywhere except in the productivity data. <laughs> And that's a quote from Robert Solow, um, it's known as the Solow Paradox. His other bit was he said, um, the biggest difference he can tell by giving his secretary a computer is that before she had one, she worked for him, and afterwards, he worked for her. <laughs> um, and so Robert Solo and, um, and you know, growth economists have looked at this issue, and I think um, there's one thing which is extreme, which is very striking, which is the computer age, automation, all of this has gone alongside slowing productivity growth over the least the last 30 years. Um, but there was a blip. In the late 1990s, productivity actually increased. So what was different about technology in the late 1990s? Well, um, in the late 1990s, um, you're probably thinking that the, te the dot com bubble was coming soon after that. Um, but maybe some of that um, euphoria was driven by the fact that firms at the time embedded technologies into the way they work. So it wasn't just that you made an invention, it was actually about how that changed the way that your workplace functions. So embedding technology takes time. So you have a big invention and then actually takes incremental micro inventions before the technology is useful. So we tend to admire things like robots. So I've met Pepper, the, uh, the robot um, by SoftBank in Japan. So Pepper is a humanoid robot. Um, Pepper um, at, is a companion robot. So Pepper's job um, is to read emotion. So I use this as an example because Pepper is very advanced in terms of um, AI and is actually a robot. Um, but how does Pepper raise productivity? We may not know yet um, for a number of years until Pepper is properly, that technology is integrated into the way we work. Um, but I was speaking on a panel about Pepper um, at a business conference, and it was not Paul, by the way, before you guys look at him. The guy next to me said, well, I don't know how Pepper can raise productivity, but if I had a robot who, who could read emotion in my household, it helped my marriage. <laughs> so maybe there's other benefits. <laughs> but, but so Paul, I mean, are the productivity gains ahead and we haven't seen them yet? Are we measuring something wrong? Is the robot thing overblown? Well, look, 
we're, we're expecting something that we're not going to see. That's my idea. I, I think that, first of all, I buy the, the, the automation thesis. I think the, 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 the Oxford Martin School research 2013, 47% of all jobs are, are susceptible in 20 or 30 years, is right. Uh, some people challenge that. And I think we're right to keep on interrogating that, that model. But I think it's, it's right. And, and these jobs exist both at the high end, so commercial law, junior commercial law, junior partners in consultancy firms. There's no a problem for a pipeline of junior partners because, because the computer is doing what the, the junior guy used to do, or, or, or woman. Um, and at the very low end, you know, the, the, Amazon, uh, the Amazon fulfillment, 500,000 people in this country are men driving vans. Uh, not for long, I'm sorry. Uh, not, for, not in 20 years' time. So this will, this will happen. Now, the question is, up until now, capitalism always creates jobs, and it even creates high-value jobs where it destroys lo uh, or lowers the value of other jobs. I don't think automation can allow us to do that. And therefore, the, the absence of a productivity uh, boost comes from a, a series of factors. The first of all is the failure to, uh, to emerge of what... Um, Carlotta Perez, who's an economic historian and an economist, calls a techno-economic paradigm. In a techno-economic paradigm, if you're a young person leaving university with some money, you kind of know, here's how I make money. You don't have to find it out. It usually comes 10 or 15 years into the tech revolution. That's not obvious, no. But it's obvious what you can do. Obviously, you can put it into Bitcoin, or you can put it into commercial property, or you can, you, I, you can do rent-seeking uh, speculative activity. But it's not obvious how, how an entrepreneurship works. I think when we get there, it will. It will start to deliver some productivity uh, benefits. But here's the bigger problem. Um, we go right back. One of the reasons the dot-com boom bust happened, and then the, the, the securitization boom bust, is the misperception by policymakers of, of, an, of, an ex of an expectation that wealth was going to be created by digital technology. Um, Greenspan even says it. He says it, you know, twice over, I thought that we were underestimating the growth potential of, of the new technology. We were missing... The technology. In fact, before the 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 the, the, the Nasdaq uh, bust, he even said it, the, the the market is more rational than we, the policymakers. There must be some value out there in the internet, and we're just missing it. I, and I don't. I, if you read my books, I don't think there is. I think digital technology is great at creating utility, but not at creating exchange value. And if you want to know the, the framework in which there is use value and exchange value, that's a form of economics that you do describe in your book, but it's not a very popular one. It's the one that goes back to Adam Smith, David Ricardo, and Marx. It's, it's one that allows us to see the possibility of technological change not producing market value. And that is, for me, the fundamental exp explanation. Hmm. Um, another trend that goes back to the end of the dot-com bubble in much of the globe, uh, not just in the US, also in the UK, uh, India, uh, to pick uh, a, a fast developing, uh, developing economy. Economic growth no longer seems to generate large numbers of jobs. Uh, and it, it, it's as related to the wage issue that you both have talked about. But I mean, fundamentally, lack of paychecks in your economy is the thing that the ordinary person, whether they read the business section or read economic textbooks or not, that's something everybody gets. That is the economy for most people. Why is it that economic growth is no longer translating into the same job growth that uh, traditionally we've seen in what we used to call the business cycle. And I'm curious, Linda, if there's anybody, maybe it's Joan Robinson, uh, maybe it's Keynes, uh, does someone come to mind uh, from your own research uh, who su suggests an answer to this question? Um, I think the, the answer to this question, um, you know, Paul alluded to it. I think if you look over history, technology does this place, and I think Automation is probably the reason, well, it is the reason, in manufacturing, you don't have the same job creation. So let's take the United States. It's a bit ahead of other countries. Um, if you look at the United States, manufacturing has actually returned to U.S. shores, reshoring. Um, and this predates President Trump. This was a uh, the way that businesses saw um, the higher productivity workers, the technology advancement in the United States, um, all meant, um, and this is what the head of Black and um, uh, Black and Decker, the um, uh, power tool company, told me, it costs the same to produce a power tool in the U.S. as it does in China. 
once he takes into account the productivity differences and the logistical costs of transport. Um, and he says he gets the additional Made in America branding, which helps right now as well. Um, but so I think so if you look at what's happening, so even the US with a revival of what's known as advanced manufacturing, so this is higher end manufacturing, manufacturing output is actually rising in the US but manufacturing employment is lower today than it was in 1950. So that is part of the, the explanation. The other part of the explanation, I think, is the growth of the services sector. So the services sector, so I'm going to take a guess and say nobody in this room works on a factory floor. Um, so we all work in the services sector. I don't produce anything tangible. Um, let me rephrase that. <laughs> I don't produce anything physical. Oh, okay, there's a, okay, anyways, you know what I mean. So it's called the intangible economy. So advanced economies are mostly services. Worldwide, 70% of global GDP is services. Services is known as the intangible economy. Services are things like um, consultancy, it's things like, um, uh, you know, lecturing, uh, broadcasting. So the problem with services is that on the one hand, it's more labor intensive than manufacturing, so you should expect um, job creation on the back of it. Um, but on the other hand, how well can you measure uh, the output from those jobs, which then warrants employment and wage increases, and um, given the advent of technology, um, a lot of people in the gig economy who are, hired, who are highly skilled, um, you know, they also work uh, more part-time, more, and it's separating those people from those who are really suffering from the gig economy, who are becoming non-permanent employees um, and doing piecemeal work because they have no bargaining power. So, so I guess what I'm saying is services, the intangible economy, we don't really, we can't really get our head around it, but it's so important. So another, so just one final example of this. Um, so services output is one of the hardest things to measure if you want to think about it from a business perspective. So how many of you have been in meetings that have been an utter waste of time? <laughs> well, those of you who did not raise your hands, we need to talk later. Um, how many of you have been in meetings which are brilliant brainstorming sessions that moved a decision forward? Oh, wow, this is sad. Please, somebody raise their hands. <laughs> um, so what I'm saying is a meeting is services output. Measuring the value of that is extremely hard. And this is one of the areas in which I think... Um, we have to see um, how we can understand the, uh, the role of technology, the role of policy making um, in terms of adapting to uh, this change. And there are historical lessons there as well. The first chapter of my book is called Should the Government Rebalance the Economy? And um, so Adam Smith, um, by the way, hated the services sector. He said it was full of buffoons and opera singers. <laughs> Uber was not nearly as good back in his day. <laughs> but he under, you know, but if you commoditize services the way we do today, perhaps he might change his mind. But the lessons are around what should policies do and how should businesses react when you see this kind of structural change in the economy hastened by technologies which are hard to understand as we've just been discussing. But so is that to say then, Paul, are we doomed to live in a world where large numbers of people just basically fall out of the workforce and have to subsist on something like universal basic income? Well, we're not doomed. I think we're going to have to manage the transition to a low-work society. And for that to happen, many actors in the social and civil society are going to have to abandon utopias based on work. We, the left, you know, have a utopia based on work. We have to abandon it. I, when I say this at the Trade Union Congress, there are guys pulling their hair out. Uh, they, they just don't like the idea. But if you think about it, Protestantism is, is a utopia based on work. You know, there, it's not just the left who has these utopias. Um, modern life is a utopia based on work. How many of you know Paul Mason Reuters? You know, it's, 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 in, it's in my... It's in my my gut, who I work for. Um, now, the Italian left in the 1960s came up with a very interesting concept that I've used and tried to, un to understand this, what's going on. They call it the social factory. Think about it like this. My dad's generation, factory worker, used to ask, who makes money out of the stuff I do? The, from, our, from the management point of view, it's what's the average revenue? What's the average rate of return on the employing this guy? And it was fairly obvious 
the guy who owned the factory, and it was a single fact, single ownership, private ownership uh, factory. So, so the way the, the the deal was, we work, we get decent wages, you you get rich, your your factory grows, your business grows. In the social factory, there are many streams of profit emanating from the individual. And you can argue that the wage relationship is no longer the primary one. You know, the, the person who owns your credit card debt is making a higher rate of return, probably, than the person who employs you. Likewise, the rent, you know, if you're in a, the mortgage or the rent or the automobile loan is all giving off revenue per user to capital. And then this is the, the, the smartphone. The smartphone is now the source of many revenue streams, not just to the mobile phone company and to the Apple and, and Samsung, but to the app providers. Okay, now, the issue is, given these multiple streams, what's the incentive for people to earn more money? If, since 1973, when Richard Nixon took America off all relationship and the world off all money was delinked from metal. Central banks can always provide more money, and banks can always be bailed out and told to lend more to to individuals. So, really, you could look at the entire consumer sector as a way of recycling credit and cheap money created by central banks. In that situation, there's no incentive for anybody to earn more. Um, it would be nice if they did, and it's nice to have people earning more, but I think we're trapped in a, the ultimate kind of macroeconomic fact to me is fiat money and, and, and central bank uh, loose monetary policy. Until someone tightens and says, look, your company doesn't make money, it goes bust, like we say with your poor old Jamie Oliver this week, um, or British Steel, uh, and, uh, until that begins to happen, the cruelty of capitalism is what forces innovation. And, and it forces the creation of new and more exciting and high-value jobs. We've kind of lived through a kind of non-cruelty phase. I hope we don't have to go through a cruelty phase, but we certainly have to go through a, fa a phase of renewal and regeneration. Well, Linda has a chapter on Joseph Schumpeter. He would certainly be very happy to hear these words from Paul. Uh, I want to turn to uh, something you all may have noticed, that uh, the U.S. and China are locked in a trade war. Uh, these are the two largest economies on Earth. They collectively comprise about 40% of global GDP. How worried should we be about this, and what are the stakes for the global economy, Linda? Um, I think we should be worried about it because the U.S.-China trade war, tensions, uh, whatever term you want to uh, describe it um, as, is actually coming at the worst part of the global business cycle. So growth probably peaked in the world economy and certainly in the major economies last year. And so growth rates in the US exceeded 3%, 4% at one point in one of the quarters. Um, China's growth peaked um, last year relative to this year. We have a cyclical slowdown. So the last thing you want when you have a global cyclical slowdown is to have a trade uh, dispute because it's a downside risk um, at the wrong part, really, of the cycle. And so I think um, it's not a good time for it, but they, even if the China and the U.S. resolve the trade dispute, uh, which they might do, I mean, obviously, President uh, Xi and Trump are um, mooted to meet on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Osaka at the end of this month, and China has said it wouldn't retaliate in terms of raising tariffs on uh, U.S. imports until June the 1st, so that essentially is, is suggesting they're hoping to come to some type of resolution. So say they do for political purposes because of what I said about the downside of the cycle and the fact that, um, let's not forget, there are uh, there's a big election happening in the United States next year, um, and no no government uh, wants to be in this part of the cycle come uh, the election cycle. Um, and China also has a big year next year. That's when Xi Jinping promised to deliver moderate prosperity. So say they sign some type of agreement um, to try and right the trade uh, position that won't be the end of the trade dispute because the dispute is much deeper than about what China buys from the United States. It's about a level playing field. It's about um, essentially two clashing economic systems to a large extent. But even deeper than that, it is a rivalry of superpowers. So ultimately, this is a technological 
uh, race. This is a uh, market size race. This is about who's the dominant economy in the world. And so there are structural issues to deal with. China isn't as open as the United States. Um, but the underlying issue is the rise of um, a challenger to the United States. And I still remember Larry Summers once said to me, um, if you ask a country like um, Japan, um, you know, at the time Japan's the world's second biggest economy, um, Japan quite likes the G2. If you ask Britain, um, they quite like the G7 because, you know, you're part of the club of influencing, you know, major economies. But if you, in, in, in America's heart of hearts, America really just wants to be the G1. <laughs> and I think that's at the heart of it. So what does a G1 world look like for the rest of the global economy, Paul? I don't know where to get it. Um, I think um, China, its medium-term interest is the maintenance of economic globalization. This is what uh, President Xi sa said at the Davos conference when, he, when he, he, he turned up. He was almost the only person left defending economic globalization. Globalization of human rights, not so much. Uh, but look, we are... The, the, the question is, can we maintain a multilateral global system, which would consist of the WTO, uh, the Bank for International Settlements, um, all the bilateral trade treaties, the IMF, the World Bank, etc. That's the question, the existential question. And I think that um, Trump has decided to become a wrecking ball to all of that. You know, we in the, the, the British right wants to leave um, Europe and join the W and sort of trade on WTO terms. There's no judges at the WTO because Trump won't appoint any. It's, it's, there's a ripping apart of the multilateral fabric. Um, the, the, histori the historian Charles Kindleberger said of the 1930s, it wasn't solved until one country came forward as the, as, as the, behavior, the, standards, the, 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 the standard setter for behavior and the absorber of all the excess capital, and that was America. And I think in a way what Trump is saying to China right now is, until you're ready to lead the world, we, that was our role, and the pushback on trade is, you know, we are going to set certain standards. Now, however duplicitous you think, say, Trump or even our own uh, lovely government is, you know, the, the, the Huawei issue is, is a good example of this. Now, it's had Im immediate uh, blowback to consumers. Consumers are walking around with these brilliant phones in their pockets, best camera on the market by far, a bit big, but suddenly uh, Google no longer is going to support it because they can't legally support the thing. Immediate technological bulk organization in the pockets of 16-year-old young women who don't understand it. What's happened? My phone won't work in the future. Now, the, the reason that is, is happening is because I think that the two sides are giving each other the cause for conflict, the casus belli, um, the, 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 the risks inside the Huawei system, quite well documented by our own security services, provide Trump with the reason to do this, this thing. Uh, I think we're, whether we're in or outside Europe, Britain is lucky that we're going to be close to a trading block in which it is a no-brainer for us to participate in whatever form we do, single market, customs union. Uh, it will be a great absorber of pressure, I think, for us. And the American society is, of course, as you all described, under pressure. And, and my, my big worry is that, you know, Trump, Trump leaves office in 2020, the, whether it's Biden or Buttigieg or anybody else replaces him, the, the, the levels of social tension and unacceptability for that section of the American right then really spark another internal crisis in America. China will be sitting pretty, to be honest, because there's plenty of more catch-up growth for the in inland China, plenty of more people, you know, there's a shortage of, of young people, there's, pl there's, pl there's plenty of more productivity gains to be made in China, in America not. So we have just a couple minutes left. Very briefly, I would be remiss if I did not ask you sitting in central London about the economic stakes of Brexit, assuming there is some form, and that is a large assumption at this moment, that there is some form of Brexit. Uh, what does that mean for the British economy and, and for Europe? And very briefly, please, Linda. Well, actually, it is very brief. Uh <laughs> uh, anyone on Twitter want to tell us what, you know, what the latest developments are? I mean, I think I've always said um, the only certain thing about Brexit is uncertainty. Um, but, but what are and, the economic consequences, though, of some form of exit? Yeah, so I think across the... Um, Essentially, if you think about um, the dislocation from removing yourself from the world's biggest economic bloc, there's going to be a 
uh, short-term economic um, harm. I mean, you have to essentially accept, you have to change systems, you're going to have greater logistics costs. So I think all of that um, can be mitigated if there was a suitably long transition period where you have a standstill and then you try and essentially shift onto a new system which, um, you know, one hopes um, would be, um, you know, <laughs> I say hope because you know, the future relationship is really unknown. But I think the longer term picture I would stress, and we don't have a great deal um, of time here, is that I actually think um, in many ways, um, Britain was always sort of sitting outside of um, the Euro, uh, obviously the Euro system, but the European project, Britain was not going to join the single currency. It was the only country with an opt-out besides Denmark. And so you already had, I think, um, as the Euro system became more integrated in terms of institutions, as well as now looking increasingly like a fiscal <coughs> um, side to that monetary union, um, Britain was always sort of sitting outside it. It was going to have to rethink its role. So the bigger question is, what is Britain's role um, in the uh, world economy? And I think briefly, one of the things that Britain should strike should think hard about is what is the 21st century world economy? Exactly. It's digital, it's services, it's going to be uh, highly mobile, information moves across borders. Where does the world's second biggest services exporter after only the United States sit? It needs to sit as a global trading hub. So what is a global trading hub? It is the country that has trade agreements, or if you don't want to call them trade agreements, agreements on services, whatever you want to describe it as, with countries that don't have agreements with each other. So to give you an example, Israel was the only country with a free trade agreement with both the EU and the US in the early 1990s. It really benefited the funneling um, of trade. And so can Britain get there? I think that's where the... Um, yeah. The question is, remember, it's a rich country, prosperous country, has issues, but it's the world's <laughs> fifth biggest economy yep. with an international financial center. So we mustn't be too gloomy about it. No, we're not the sixth biggest. We, France didn't overtake us. It was just an exchange rate thing. <laughs> I, I, I mean, just to push back on that and throw this to you, Paul, I mean, Britain is something like 3% of global economic output leaving one of the largest economic blocks. So if that actually happens, how do you see the consequences? I think, um, I think let me just say, first of all say, and people do know, I, I, I move in the circles where these things are happening. I think that the likely outcomes now are a, a conservative government that, that replaces Theresa May quite soon, that will seek the FTA, the, the free trade agreement, outcome. That's, that's, that's the, the political logic of what's happening tonight and every, and all, every other night to the Conservative Party. They're going to seek uh, the freedom to do a free trade agreement. It's not illogical. It's just that um, that wasn't I think well prepared. We've had our own our own technocracy and our civil service preparing for a customs union and single market alignment outcome. So it's going to be even more fractured. Like you say, I'm you know I'm pro remain, but if we rem if we're outside, it might be more logical to start doing aggressive FTAs with lots of people. Um, but in the meantime, the, the the deeper problem, the English, the British disease is is the malaise of who who we are and how, where is our high value sector. Because if the modern economy is people, ideas and things, the large parts of Britain, places that voted for Brexit, I come from one of them, Wigan, um, it's the absence of ready money and educated people. Uh, and, and the hope drains out when you've got those two things. That you, if you're an entrepreneur, it doesn't matter how good your idea, don't set it up there because there is no money there and there's no people to buy anything. And I think that until we as Britain get an idea of what, what, it, what we want to be good at in the 21st century, because unfortunately the, the finance industry and the services export are great for people who can do it, but we've be become the global hub of that. You know, Mama Merrill, you know, everybody used to call Merrill Lynch Mama Merrill because everybody worked there was Italian. You know, we, the city is an international hub and we've annoyed a lot of people. We've annoyed cultural producers. The world is breaking up for cultural producers. You know, the biennials, the triennials, that where these high value pr cultural producers move through the Cannes Film, and Cannes Film Festival, get, try getting a visa. Try getting the artwork from one country to another. So if we, we want to be good at something, we've got to be absolutely good at openness. And this is what still leads me to try and, and, and say the best outcome would be the one where we have a big rethink about the whole thing. 
Uh, well, we've covered a lot of ground. I'd love to hear some questions from the audience uh, directed at anyone you like. Yes, sir. So I have a the first one was that uh, you didn't really mention the word equality, right? Because at the end of the day, there's slow uh, growth in productivity, but there's a massive part of the population that doesn't have the opportunity to produce anything, but there's a tiny majority, tiny minority that produces a lot. Right, that's the first part. The other one, though, is that I think we're thinking about productivity and productivity growth in the wrong way. We're not, we're, we assume it's um, uh, the value of something, right? Uh, and that fundamentally has to change. Uh, I, Can I, I, I go ahead. Yeah, yeah, so I've got a I've got a chapter on inequality, <laughs> um, and so it's called "Is Inequality Inevitable?" And so what I do is I look at. Um, again, through history, um, what can we learn about from societies that have grown more equitably? Because this is obviously, inequality differs a great deal across countries as well as within countries in terms of dimension. So one of the great economists that I write about is Alfred Marshall, the Cambridge economist who founded the neoclassical school of economics. Um, and he was a late Victorian. That was when consensus broke down around capitalism. So he was the neoclassical school because they looked at the capitalism of the classical economists and decided that um, that, was, that was, at the time, um, really under challenge. So because that late 19th century period, um, that late Victorian period, uh, was when we had the first Great Depression of the 19th century, it's known as the Long Depression. Unemployment first appeared in the dictionary. Uh, trained unionism started. Um, inequality was so huge. It was called the Gilded Age. And people really, the consensus broke down around whether this is the right system. 60% of the world by the early part of the 20th century lived in communist or socialist countries. So what the market-based economies did was that they rethought um, the market-based economy. And neoclassical economists believed in the deserving poor, helping them. And it didn't de-incentivize de work. It just made the society more equitable. And that led to neoclassical economics, welfare state capitalism, and the system that we live with today, with the NHS here, Social Security in America. And so this battle of ideas was so fierce, the great economists engaged in it, not on technocratic arguments about, you know, uh, you know, things that you, you tend to hear in academic circles. They actually argued um, that fundamentally it was about democracy. Um, having, um, you know, the system was associated, your, um, you know, your value as a person was associated with your rights and a democratic system had to accommodate that. So these, this fierce battle really, I think, didn't, um, didn't resolve itself probably until the end of the Cold War when it looked like the uh, capitalist system um, gained ascendancy over the alternatives. But as we know now today, America's in the second Gilded Age. Consensus has broken down around the, the market economy that we have. There's also a backlash against globalization. Inequality is so high in the United States, it's called the second Gilded Age. So is inequality inevitable? Yes, because in a market-based system, people have different returns, but the level of inequality is a political choice. That's what history teaches us, and that's what you also learn if you go across countries. I'm going to leave the harder question about productivity to Paul. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't have an answer, but I, I do want to come back on the, t on the inequality because I think the, the two specifics we know about inequality, if you think about Thomas Piketty's book, Capital in the 21st Century, is that when the asset wealth, when the rich when the incomes of the rich are generated by asset wealth rather than entrepreneurship, th it, then a combination where, of a situation where the assets are scarce but the money is uh, abundant from a central bank can create a situation where the rich just get richer in terms of assets and the assets, some of them, give off an income. Uh, and so the poor have no assets, so they never take part in the, you know, if you think about the average 30 year old is trying to get on, they're renting or sharing a room. Professionals, as you know, do this all the time now in London. The, their big problem isn't just that they're, they're spending their income on, a, on huge amounts of income on rent, is that they can never own an asset, so they can't take 
part in the two or three asset booms that will probably take place during their adult lifetime. Now, that's new in the sense that, oh, it's not new, it's quite a, a long-term thing for capitalism. But in, in our living memory, we lived in a situation where, where my dad, me, we, we were all able to take part in the purchase of key assets. Now, that's the, the one we, we know, and, and Piketty, his answer to it, which is, it, it's no question of how you cal calibrate this, it's, it's, a, it's, it's taxes on assets. Now, I've been in discussions with, with city people where they've been in discussion with the potential future Labour government, and the, 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 the people with a lot of money, the, the long-term money, are quite happy with, with taxing on assets. They want a stable society in which, rich pe in, in which poor people can all grow old stably and draw down pension money. That's fine, but people with short-term financial strategies really don't like, let me put it this way, they really don't like the idea of asset uh, taxes. You know, they all, they, they, they didn't, it, the dessert of the dinner was not really well digested when, 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 when it was suggested that the financial transaction tax, asset taxes on rich people. So that's a really difficult thing for all governments. It doesn't matter who they are to do. The other inequality we're seeing is technological inequality. And it's something I focus a lot about, uh, on in my work. That is asymmetries of power. You know, markets are meant to iron out power asymmetries and, and asymmetries of information. You know, the neoclassical economics assumes that the market effectively can, can, can solve the problem that I know more than you do because the market itself is a big information machine and I find out what you are doing. Um, the, 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 the factory system was invented in a, a Derbyshire village called Cromford um, and then within 10 years there was a, a, a town called Cromford in um, Connecticut, USA with a factory in it uh, because somebody just moved there and the patent laws didn't exist. There's also one in Germany called Cromford uh, with a, which is the early German factory. This is not allowed to happen anymore. But the, 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 somebody with a technological patent like Richard Arkwright who invented the factory, you can go and visit it in Derbyshire even now, can actually stick hold of the factory idea so that nobody can uh, replicate it. And what does, what does that mean? The people who, who, who pioneered the early capitalism were men in sheds. You know, they were, they, right, Hartwright himself was a barber who invented a machine. And, and think about this. When is a McDonald's employee or a Starbucks employee asked, do you think, do you have any ideas about how we could make the product better? It's almost like the product is this immutable thing, and what your job is to do is to make the delivery of it more efficient year on year. Now, that's also the, an, 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 a form of innovation, um, innovating the process. But the, it's like almost that the, these huge power asymmetries and information asymmetries are holding back our ability to imagine different solutions. And I think that's one of the biggest problems we have. Uh, I want to take another question. Yeah, I'm, I'm conscious we're very, very tight on time, so I'm in danger of opening a, a, a very broad topic here, which we can maybe have a conversation over a drink later. But you've not mentioned anything about environment or climate. Uh, this is a topic which is very high profile You know, in the last few months. We can't escape David Attenborough on the television. I have three children. Their main concern in life isn't about having an economy, it's having a, a world to live in. Um, is this going to have any impact on um, the future of the economy in the next 10 years? Or are we in danger of carrying on as if nothing's going to happen until it does? P Paul's book actually deals very directly with this question. So why, why don't you take that, Paul? I think that um, the there is no permission for, for, for politicians to discuss radical action. The radical action is, isn't the design of the transition to the zero carbon world. That, as David Attenborough said, you know, that's, we know what the problems are, we know what the technical solutions are. So you decarbonize transport, you, de you decarbonize um, the, the use of energy and the production of energy. Uh, the, food is a big thing as well, air transport. These are the big chunks of the project. You know, if it's on a project management graph, that's what they would be. The, it's gonna need, fiscal and monetary expansion. And, and that debate has begun in America because as I said before, weirdly, Trump who just expands, you know, the, the it's just quite happy to run up debt and quite happy for the Fed to have a loose, uh, econ loose monetary policy. Really a Keynesian. Yeah, I, I, in a way, he is. But, but now American economics is going beyond Keynesianism. I mean, I don't agree with these guys, theoretically, but the so-called modern monetary theorists uh, who think that you just 
print money and then the state borrows that money and that solves everything. No, there are not only central bankers are now starting to notice this as a theory. Why? Because I think it's likely that someone will come to power who holds this theory, and what they will say, yeah, and, and what they will do, uh, what they will do is to say, okay, we're gonna, you know, what's the, the U.S. deficit now is a trillion dollars, five percent of the of GDP. Un, under under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, it was it was the equivalent would be four to ten trillion dollars a year borrowed to finance a Green New Deal. I think that debate is gonna come, it's coming here. I'm, if I can help it, I'm gonna make it come here. But your children are, are right to be worried because the time scales, given the institutional par paralysis and the scale of climate science denial and the, the vested interests of the fossil fuel industry, I think it's, they're right to be worried because the people who wanna do this might lose. And, well then, if the scientists are right, in the back half of the century, we do get, we do get real GDP effects of rising water levels, uh, fires, storms. Really briefly, Linda, just to close this out, I mean, is capitalism equipped to deal with the adjustment that's required in the face of climate change? Yeah, I mean, the answer is yes. The question is the political will. So I should have probably said um, both of the questions that you raised, inequality and climate. When I give book, book talks, I never have enough time, and I've got 13 chapters of issues, and I normally get people to raise their hands to say what they're most interested in. And these actually are the two topics people are most interested in. So can economics adapt? Well, yes, and in one sense it already has because the Nobel Prize in Economics was won jointly by William Nordhaus of Yale, and he incorporated specifically climate um, into growth models, and that is a culmination of decades of work by him and many others. The question is, will there be, as Paul said, the political will and the time frame um, to do something about it? And I think as, as you think about um, the ways in which I've described briefly how capitalism has been dismantled in the past, like seriously dismantled. Um, you know, we may well be coming into that kind of era with climate and inequality, perhaps as these as these triggers. Um, and in fact, I probably should have um, just mentioned that. Um, Karl Marx, who we haven't talked about, which I write about. Um, Marx, uh, Marx always believed that capitalism would lead to crisis, and the crisis would lead to revolution, and the revolution would lead to the only equitable system, um, which is the state making decisions, communism. The crisis part, he thought, the long depression was going to be that crisis. Friedrich Engels, the most underappreciated co-author in history, um, started practicing, um, his co-author who funded him, started practicing shooting on horseback. <laughs> he was ready for the revolution. And then it turned out after the long depression, um, there was no revolution. So like all good economists, Marx changed his theory. He then decided the crisis was inequality. That was going to trigger the real unrest, but maybe today, it's the environment. And as we think about the 21st century, the kind of system that's you know, good enough for the world in which we want to live in, this is the time to revisit those ideas, bring in your own ideas, and have a public debate, um, and be active. Because that's the only way you'll have an impact on the society in which we live. And to me, this is the opportunity during a time when things feel like there's a breakdown in consensus. It's about um, this is the time when the great thinkers make their contribution. So I hope um, after today, um, we may gave you a sense of that, that over history, we come through it, but it does take um, the kind of engagement that you've shown this evening, sitting here listening to us talk about economics. <laughs> well, we may not survive, but we're not going to be bored. That's my takeaway. Uh, thank you all for coming. Please join me in giving a big round of applause to Linda and Paul. I, I, I genuinely uh, recommend uh, both of their books. Uh, they're really very engaging and accessible. Uh, this is uh, not the end of the evening, but it's the end of this phase. Thank you all for coming out on behalf of the London Speakers Bureau. And please uh, continue the conversation out there where we've got drinks and canapes and more conversation. Thank you. <laughs>